In this video, I'm going to show the analysis capabilities of LibreOffice Calc. LibreOffice is a free open source clone, sort of in quotes, very similar program to Microsoft Office. It's in many ways works the same, supports many of the same file formats, it's freely available, you don't have to pay any money for it, well, you can donate to the foundation that uh, manages it and runs it and develops it. It's basically, Calc is one component, which is basically a spreadsheet. And what I have here is some data. This is polling data on the approval ratings and disapproval ratings of President Biden up to the present time. I have another video which shows how I was able to get this data out of a difficult to analyze web page where you actually couldn't easily select the data and copy it the normal way, but I was able to do it anyway with a tool called Camelot, so some people may find that video of interest. However, what I'm going to focus on here is trying to get a deeper understanding of what's happening here. This is just one example. In many cases, when we're looking at data, we want to try to understand the cause behind changes. We want to know what controls what happens, usually for the purpose of optimization. In other words, if I was working for President Biden, I'd like to know why his approval ratings have dive bombed and what you could do to make the president more popular, for example. If I was working for the Republicans, obviously I would want to know what I could do to make him less popular. To do that, I need to understand what's driving the data, what the actual causal mechanisms are, which as you can see, you can't really tell, although I have a theory that I like to investigate. My theory, okay, so the blue squares are the approval rating. And uh, what I'm going to do is do a little bit of analysis to see if I can get a deeper insight into this. And in particular, I suspect a lot of this can be traced to the failure of the um, COVID-19 vaccines to prevent infection and transmission, which became apparent in the summer. And I'll go ahead and show that in a minute. What I'm going to do is change this. I'm going to create a copy so I can fiddle around without destroying my original work. So I'm going to call that um, um, workspace, for example. All right, so I've created a copy up here of this. This way I can fiddle around with it. If I break something or I destroy it, I still have the original data and everything uncorrupted. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to focus on one of these data sets. They're really kind of symmetric. So, okay, so let me just show this clearly. Okay. I double click to get access to the chart, to actually select it. Now what I want to do is select the data series here, the disapproval uh, ratings, and I'm going to just delete those. So I'm only looking at one of the data sets, so it's easier to understand uh, what I'm looking at. Um, so that's one thing I'm going to do. And then something else I would like to do is put in some grids to make it a little easier to read. And I'll also put in the minor grids. Personally, I find this a little bit better at figuring out where things are. Okay, so there's some minor things. And remember, what I did is I double clicked on this, then I uh, clicked on the chart here. You can tell what's selected within the chart by these uh, squares here. These transparent squares show what item is selected. So here, here I've selected the data series. Here I've selected the horizontal axis or x-axis. Um, I'm not sure if I can effectively. I can select the label here, and I can select the legend here, just to give you a feel of how you navigate around. So what I'm interested in doing is understanding what's happening here. And uh, by eye, it's a little hard to tell. I think if you look at it, you can see it's, his approval seems pretty steady up until about here, which is about July. And then you see a fairly sharp dot decline, and then it kind of stabilizes a bit afterwards. Now, that's by eye, it's very rough. You'd like to have a much more quantitative estimate of that. And I'll show how you would try to figure that out with LibreOffice Calc, and uh, you'll see what its limited capabilities are. Uh, you really need a more sophisticated tool than kind of the easily accessible features of LibreOffice Calc. You really need to do a more sophisticated model analysis. I'm not going to show that here. I'm just going to show what you can do with LibreOffice Calc to analyze data. And you'll see uh, its capabilities are somewhat limited. They can be useful for pretty simple data. And even this data, which I suspect is not all that complicated in terms of what the causal mechanism is, 
is difficult for it to now analyze. So that's a problem when you need better tools. All right, so let's go here. We've selected the data, and we'll, I will right-click with my uh, pointing device. I have a trackball. Uh, the same would apply for a mouse. And what I want to do in, is what it calls insert a trend line, uh, which is, on the one hand, easy to understand, but on another hand, um, a little bit confusing. I mean, if you think about what you're trying to do, it's not exactly a trend line. So what I'm going to do is, remember, you might think of this as, Okay, now what's important, again, th some of the terms here are, are not that intuitive. So when you add a trend line, it defaults to this line, and you can choose how thick it is, what color it is, make it easier for you to view. You can make it transparent. I'm not going to show that. And then you have a small set of possible functions or models which you could use to say, well, we think the data is this. And it shows you a little graphic. So linear refers to a straight line like you make with a ruler. Logarithmic, that, okay, if you're in math, you do actually understand what that means. It shows you, again, a kind of a plot of what the model would look like. It pretty obviously doesn't look like that, right? Same way with exponential. This is like compounding interest. It's an example of an exponential process where you get this dramatic growth. Um, uh, there's power law decline, which uh, I'm not familiar with a simple, easy, real-world example. Or there are actually many cases where it turns up, but they're kind of esoteric in physics or other areas. Uh, polynomial, which is like a plus x squared. An example of a process that's controlled by a polynomial, a very simple polynomial, is dropping a, a, a weight, like a, a billiard ball or something, off a building. And the, the distance it travels is proportional to the square of the time. So it will travel, for example, uh, 16 feet in one second, and um, I believe it's about 32 in two seconds, and it's one half times 32, 16 times um, nine, actually, in three seconds. So three seconds squared, so you actually get uh, like over 100 feet or something like that. So a poly that's a simple example of a polynomial that you will run into in real life. And a moving average just kind of smooths out the line. It doesn't really use a model. So what I'm going to start with is just say, well, what happens if we make we think maybe this is a line? Now, what's good to do here is you want to see what the equation is, because each of these is different, so you want to know what they are. And this is really important. This is the coefficient of determination. It's, what is also known as a goodness of fit statistic. There are many different goodness of fit statistics. This is one of the most popular, probably one of the most useful. It essentially gives you an estimate of the percentage of the data, the variation in the data that your model, which in this case is just a straight line, quote, explains. So how close it really is to the model you're using. So let me show that result. So how we have a line here, and of course it proceeds to put, so this is an important thing in terms of practical use of it. I'm going to select the inf this information that was put out that I asked it to show. This is the model. It's a simple linear model. You can see the line here, and it has this R squared, which just seems very cryptic. This is essentially a measure to, to first, is roughly the percentage of what's going on that the model explains. So it's only 63% here. It's 0.636, etc. And in percent, that would be 63%. That's not a great model. It's not a terrible model. It does, but he's pretty far from just a simple linear fall. And that's probably because it's more like he goes for a while here, and then in July and August there's a drop, and then it probably slows down a bit. And that's probably why you're seeing that. So why is the coefficient of determination so useful? It corresponds, in some respects, to what we really care about from a sort of practical use from engineering point of view. In other words, we don't need a perfect model. And in fact, virtually no models are 100% perfect if you actually look into them. Uh, inevitably, there will be some imperfection in our model and its comparison with the real world. But if that imperfection is really, really small, we don't care. And how small does it have to be? Well, for some applications, if you're good to within 5%, you're very happy. Uh, for example, if I was investing in the stock market and I could predict increases and decreases to within 5%, say, in the next year, I could identify stocks 
that I would make money on. I might make a little bit less, a little bit more, but I would still be perfectly happy with 5%. If you're buying a shirt, right, you don't have to be an exact match to get the shirt to be comfortable and a good fit. It probably needs to be good to within maybe a few percent, something like that. There are other applications, um, uh, rocketry, for example, or celestial navigation, like getting people to the moon. The moon is really tiny compared to the distance that's being traveled. It's only a thousand miles or so across, or a couple thousand miles across. And, um, you know, we have to travel 186,000 miles, actually more, I think, to get from the Earth to the moon. So you have to actually land on the moon and not miss the moon, right? That was actually a serious concern in the Apollo moon missions. And so a lot of work was put into developing computers and technology to get the uh, rocket to actually reach the moon and land on the intended target. And it's even more difficult when you're talking about going to Mars. We lost probes going to Mars in the early days in the 60s. Why am I saying this? Because we can predict the motions of the planets where Mars and the moon are to within, you know, one in a hundred thousand, something like that, a tiny, tiny fraction of a percent. And sometimes that's exactly what you need. You need models that are that good. And this R squared, for example, gives us a kind of rough feeling about how good the model is in practical terms. In other words, is it close enough for engineering purposes? Can we predict what's going to happen when we fiddle with something well enough to be pretty strongly confident or even certain that we're going to succeed, even though we are a little off, right? We, we don't know, uh, even with the moon, there are slight uncertainties, things we don't understand, but they're so tiny that we can safely land on the moon. So R squared has the advantage that it sort of corresponds to this kind of practical goal. Other goodness of fit statistics, like what's known as chi squared, I'm not going to go into what exactly it is, or the probability of the chi squared, which are very popular in use also in the scientific literature, really don't give you that kind of information. And that's one of the reasons R squared is widely used. You see it a lot in economics and certain other fields. It's probably underutilized in or even not utilized in fields where it would actually probably be a better way. And certainly if you're doing engineering, you're really concerned with, is the model good enough? All right, so let's try a different model. All right, so we're going to do this again, and we're going to insert another trend line. Okay, this time it's not going to be linear. I'm just going to try a polynomial model. All right, and I'm going to make it, uh, second degree would be like a parabola-like gravity, where you just have um, the square, for example, of what it is. I'm going to make it larger, and you'll see why that's useful. Four, five, six, okay, so it's going to be have a lot of terms. And I'll explain when I show this why that's significant, the large number of terms. Okay, so let's take a look at our line. We want a different color for the line, uh, so we can easily distinguish them. I'm going to try yellow, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to make it uh, wider, so it's easier to see. And uh, perhaps we'll experiment with um, transparency. And often about half is good. All right, so now we can see the line for the quote polynomial. And, oh, I forgot to do something. Okay, let's see if I can uh, fix that. So what I forgot to do, okay, is there's also type. I want to show the equation. I want to show the coefficient of determination for it. All right, so I put in this information here as well. Now I want to put it out where I can actually see it somewhere. Um, let me put it up here for now. Okay, not maybe not the ideal location. Let me make this a little bit larger so you can see these things more clearly. All right, so actually I think... Yeah, okay, that probably we can just pull it down here, I think, now that we've made it larger. Okay, so you have to fiddle around a little bit. So the reason for doing this is so I can clearly distinguish between the two models. This is a simple line. Polynomial is very complicated, and it has better, somewhat better agreement with the data. That doesn't really mean very much in the case of a polynomial or other complicated models. The more complex you make the model, in the case of polynomials, the more terms you add, it becomes more flexible. Like a piece of rubber, eventually it's like saran wrap. It will actually shape itself to the data. And therefore, the fact that you have very good agreement isn't really that meaningful. That's a very advanced topic. I'm not going to really talk about that too much in this video. But you can see that it matches the data a little bit better. That's probably mostly this saran wrap behavior. Um, you can see it's kind of moving around here. and It comes down here. What we'd really like to do is have a... Uh, 
what's called a sigmoid or a threshold function where you know if it's pretty flat here it suddenly drops here and comes over here and that almost certainly would match the data better and be more realistic but that's not built into this trend line uh, feature which is easily accessible and usable in LibreOffice Calc. So let me try one more line just to give more of a feel for the data. So let me see here. We want to um, click on this may be um, let's see if I can um, let's try inserting a trend line here. Okay. So I'm going to try one more thing and I'm going to make this a little bit longer. I believe the period here is the uh, number of data points. So this is roughly weekly data. So let's try it, smoothing it over a month, basically, four weeks. I'm just going to leave it here. These have what's smoothed. This is smoothing the preceding. I believe it is smoothing the preceding four data points. Let's see what we get here. Um, let's go to the line. Again, we want to have a distinguishable color. I'm going to try gold. Okay, and um, we'll make it bigger again. And uh, let's just do that and see what happens. There it is. So this is smoothed over a period of about a month. And you can see he's kind of bumping around here up until around here, maybe July or so. And there's a pretty sharp decline, and then I think it flattens out. That's what I see by eye, and the moving average kind of shows that more clearly than the other two. None of these is really great, and there are more advanced techniques which I will perhaps be able to show in future videos, but for right now, this is the kind of capability that LibreOffice Calc has, so when you have some data, if it has a very simple underlying model or process or whatever terminology you want, like a straight line, for example, you can successfully look at that and get a measure of how good it is. What are some rules of thumb here? The R squared, probably you should pretty much dismiss models under 0.50 or 50% agreement. Now people actually publish papers and do all kinds of things. I'm not saying there can't be some useful information, but that's pretty poor agreement if you can't explain the majority of the variation in the data. Think about that. You, you can't even explain the majority of it. Again, how how large this number is depends on your goal what you're trying to figure out, right? As I said, if for some applications, if this was 95%, that would be very, very good. If it was 0.95, that would be more than adequate. For some, as I said, like just getting something to the moon, that's not good enough. You could easily miss the moon with a 5% error. If you're in rocketry, you need a much better model. We have much better models for some processes, for some things like celestial navigation, like rocketry. So it really depends on your engineering goal, your practical goals, what's a good value. Kind of a general rule of thumb is probably you should be thinking in terms of at least 90%, at least 0 0.90. And if it's below that, doesn't mean you don't use it, but obviously you're still not explaining a lot of the data. So in a nutshell, that's how to use the trend line feature of the charts in LibreOffice Calc. As you can see, it's fairly limited. Um, let me just show that get limitation again and briefly um, do that. So insert trend line. Uh, it's not doing it right. Okay, let me do this. Okay, I think, yeah, okay. So here I've selected one of the data points of the actual data points. And so I, just to show these again, this is just the formatting of the line it shows, which is the model. And you have a very limited uh, library or dictionary or whatever you want to call it of known mathematical functions, essentially, that might describe the data. And these do describe some things that happen. Some things really are straight lines or these other models. But this is a pretty simple data set, and yet... Um, you know, as you can see, uh, it's it's pretty limited in what you can do here. And, uh, let me say that there are better tools. Um, there are better math tools that are, take, have a much higher learning curve and don't have like a GUI like this that's sort of intu arguably intuitive. I mean, I think some of these names and things could be better. But one nice thing here, you can see the uh, what the model would look like. And when you're using tools like MATLAB or Python or our statistical programming language. They often, you can do these things, you can get plots like this, but you have to do a lot of programming and other stuff, which is you know, obviously takes time and is inconvenient. So my business is working on developing much larger libraries than this and automated recognition of, of the data. So instead of you having to we'll sort through this and try to figure out and guess what one of these models might be correct, you have you know much bigger database, ideally literally hundreds of thousands, in the future of 
different models, and it just automatically, through pattern recognition, figures out what the likely ones are. The human still has to intervene and probably select and do some twiddling, but they have a, a rank-ordered list of the best models, and you can look at it by eye and see if you agree with what the AI program concluded. Very much like using a search engine, where you get an ordered list of the best search matches. Number one may not be the best, but hopefully what you're looking for is in the top five or the top ten. And that's the kind of system we're developing. Um, I may show that system working on this uh, simple, you know, data in the near future. We'll, we'll see. I can't promise. Anyway, uh, this is how to take a deeper dive, a deeper look at the data, and try to get at what the causal mechanism is. Of course, I've not confirmed my theory at this point. I have a preconceived idea about what's happening here. I think if you look at the moving average, you can see it looks pretty flat until right about here. And we can come down to here. So again, around June. And this is when it started to become apparent that the, um, the vaccines were not preventing infection and transmission. That shouldn't be really controversial at this point. But that's not, for example, what President Biden said. He actually is on video saying that, that if you got the vaccine, you couldn't get infected and couldn't transmit it. And words, very explicit words to that effect, which of course is very damaging to your credibility when large numbers of people start to get sick, even though they're vaccinated, which of course has been going on now for quite some time. Now, the obvious point is to be certainly honest about things which people can individually themselves in their own life verify. You know, if they're if they or their neighbor gets sick after being vaccinated for with the supposed disease or COVID, obviously that's going to damage you. Uh, that's this is not this is a no-brainer, right? This is this is you know obviously the likely explanation for this drop. But perhaps in the future I'll be able to show more evidence of that or or invalidate it, show that actually there's some other explanation. There's certainly other bad news going on that can be causing this trend. This concludes this video presentation. If you like this video, please click like. Please click subscribe and the notification bell if you would like to receive more content from us. You can avoid internet censorship by subscribing directly to our RSS news feed. Please consider sharing the link by email and on your website or blog in addition to liking, upvoting, or sharing on increasingly censored, advertising beholden, big company social media. We have encountered such censorship. Mathematical software is developing algorithms and software to automate data analysis, reducing the risks of costly errors, and increasing the predictive power of the results. You can support our work financially by subscribing on our Patreon page https colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash mathsoft or scanning the QR code in the lower right corner.